Okay, why don't we go ahead and get started? So, welcome back everybody to uh, EE240. Uh, I guess people will be trickling in as they finish the homework or make their way through the crowds or whatever for today. So, before we sort of dive back in, just you know, as usual, midterms uh, week from today. Uh, so keep that in mind. Uh, it's going to be in 306 Soda, 6:30 to 8 p.m. Uh, so we're going to be starting at 6:30 sharp. So there's a full hour and a half for the exam. So no 10-minute Berkeley delay. You know, show up beforehand so you're all ready. Uh, it'll be open notes and open book and all that other stuff. No internet, you know, no phones, but other than that, you can use whatever notes you want. Um, probably won't help you all that much, you know, because it's more about thinking and kind of understanding the material, but you, know, you don't have to remember formulas or anything like that. Uh, I did post up sort of previous year's exams up on the web, so take a look at that. You know, definitely go through and practice those. As I would mentioned last time, I'll also be doing my sort of standard review session. Uh, that'll be on Tuesday, uh, 2 p.m., uh, 2 to 3 p.m., basically, over in 550 Cory. Uh, so definitely swing by for that. As I said, you know, come with your questions, because I don't have any material prepared. I'll just answer your guys' questions. Okay, other than that, any kind of questions on either logistics or material so far or anything else? Oh, that's right. So on the, on the day of the midterm, there will be no class. Uh, I'll announce that again on Tuesday. Um, so you don't actually have to show up that morning. I'll probably hold some extra office hours or something like that, uh, just in case you have last-minute questions. But there will be no class on the day of the midterm itself. Okay, any other? Say that again? It's in 306 Soda. So again, all that information is actually posted up on the web. You know, If you don't remember or didn't hear what I said or whatever, just go check on the web. It will all be there. Any other questions on things? Material is all totally clear. You guys know how to do everything you need to know with like, you know, cascodes and amplifiers and differential gain and common mode rejection and etc. Okay, well, as I said, you know, if you're not sure now, it'll uh, it'll become very clear shortly cuz you'll be having to do it and so you'll you'll have the fun of figuring out how it really works. So, last time where I think we basically ended up was kind of just talking about in the context of essentially really common mode rejection or even power supply rejection from that standpoint, just what some of the trade-offs are in terms of different, of different differential input stages you could potentially use. So we'd already kind of said that if you looked at, let's say, A versus both B and C, A was kind of the worst from the standpoint of rejecting common mode noise just because since you've tied these things to ground, if I was to tie some common mode input, let's say that would look like that, and I just move that input around, then basically the gain from that column mode input is exactly the same as the gain I would have gotten from doing a differential input, right? So by the way, just to be clear, let's pretend that there was some known R load over here. What would the differential mode gain be? Just for some simple thing like this. GMRL. Yeah, it's just GMRL, right? Okay, so now this should hopefully be obvious, but what would be the common mode gain for this? It's also GMRL, right? So now, if you remember, I had said that when I use common mode rejection, I usually talk about the mode conversion ratio. But you can imagine the larger the common mode gain is to begin with, even ideally, the larger the conversion is also going to be. Because if there's any small mismatch, let's say, you know, this is not a, you know, let's say they were both supposed to be a width of W, one of them is actually W plus delta W, right? Then obviously, if that column mode gain was large to begin with, that small mismatch is basically being amplified by an even larger factor, right? So that's why if you really care about column mode rejection, again, something like this, probably not what you want to do, right? Okay, so then next we said that if we do care about that, that's why we generally add these tail current sources in. And of course, the idea there was just that with that tail current source, I can move the common mode input around. And as long as this is an ideal current source, this tail node here will just track with a common mode. right? Because this will just keep the current constant, which means that there's a certain VGS you have to maintain across the transistor. So that if you move that input around, the source just sort of tracks up with the input, right? OK, so ideally speaking, at least at DC, especially for this one right here, the common mode gain should be 0. 
right? At least ideally. And we'll come back and see sort of you know, how things can get messed up there. OK, so now we said that at least with NMOS devices, usually you can't exactly tie the body like that. You actually have to tie the body to ground, because the body is the substrate, right? OK, so now for this one, let's again just sort of take a look at what's the differential and what's the column mode gain. So what would the differential mode gain for this thing be? Again, assuming, of course, there's some known load resistance over there. This isn't a trick question, by the way. So. GMRL. Yeah, it's just GMRL, right? OK. Now, what's the common mode gain? GMB out of There we go. It's GMB times RL. Just as a reminder, GMB, that's like the controlled body generator, the one that comes about because if you move the body to source voltage, the threshold shifts a little bit, right? So now notice if before the ADM over ACM over here, the one that was really bad, that was equal to 1. Well, now in this one, it's just totally set by GM over GMB. Okay? Anybody have an idea what, how big is that number, GM over GMB, roughly speaking? 10. Yeah, 10, 5, maybe 15, right? So if you really care about column mode rejection, you may in fact not want to use this NMOS input pair. Just because if you do, your kind of your column mode rejection is really just limited by that GMB. Right? Or really the ratio between GMB and the GM itself. Okay? And unfortunately, you know, that may or may not be as high as you really want it to be. Okay? So if you really, really care about column mode rejection, you'd like to do something like this. So you may not actually be able to do that with NMOSs. You might actually have to use a PMOS input pair where you can actually tie the bodies up. Okay. Now, even for these two things that I drew sort of over here, is it really the case that across all frequencies I'm going to get, let's say in this one, am I really going to get infinite column mode rejection across all frequencies, or is something going to get messed up at some point? What do you guys think? Yeah. You'll have a capacitive current at the source node. Okay. Why is that bad? Because that will cause a common mode current to flow in the resistance. Right. Exactly. So if I get to a high enough frequency, right, where this capacitor is basically a short, you can't actually tell the difference between this circuit and that circuit. So although we usually say that capacitance here is not super critical, which is kind of true, Again, if you really care about column mode rejection, you have to worry about things out to pretty high frequencies, because a lot of times there is going to be a lot of junk at high frequencies. And remember I said, you're always going to try and put whatever junk you can into common mode. Well, if there's a lot of stuff at high frequencies, you have to be careful as to how much cap you put on that tail node there. Because if there's a lot of cap, your column mode rejection just won't be very good. Because now, that capacitor just makes this whole thing look like, even though it's supposed to be a current source, at high frequency, it just has low impedance. <laughs> In fact, again, if you really care about stuff like this, you might actually start building a fancier current source. As an example, you might play some of the tricks with cascoding and the sizing of the cascode device relative to this current source device, not because you really want DC very high output resistance, but just because AC, you want to make sure that the parasitic cap you're putting on here is not that large. OK? Make sense to everybody? Okay, good. So, the last kind of just couple things I wanted to briefly mention here. So I talked about column mode rejection ratio, and we already said there's all these sort of somewhat subtle ways that basically things can get a little bit messed up. Well, for both column mode and for power supply, symmetry is really, really the key. Okay, and by the way, power supply is, as we had talked about a little bit before, moving the power supply around in some senses is also very similar to moving the column mode around. Okay, so I don't want to spend a ton of time on this, but just to give you an example as to how things that look somewhat subtle actually can cause some problems, let's take a look at the following thing. So let's say I have this amplifier, which is a differential input, single-ended output, and I want to compare it to this amplifier. 
which is now going to be a fully differential amplifier. Okay? And for both of them, what I want to do is look at what happens. Oops. What happens if I put some sort of change in VDD relative to VSS? Okay? So, first of all, I'm sure you guys will agree with me that the response of this will definitely not be the same as the response of that. Right? So now let's be more specific. This guy on the left over here. If I measure this output relative to ground, at least at low frequencies, what's going to happen if that supply voltage moves up? Is this thing going to move up, move down, stay the same? What do you guys think is going to happen? OK, it's going to move up. How much is it going to move up? Roughly. So let's say this moved up by over here, I don't know, one millivolt. How much do you think the output's going to move up by? About the same. Yeah, about the same. Why is that? Uh, because the current is the same, so VGS is the same. And then because the transistor on the left is dial connected, so it also moves up by that. Right, much. exactly. So if this was really a perfect current source down on the bottom there, current didn't change. So the VGS over here has to be fixed, which means that if you move this up, well, this source node here, well, actually, yeah, actually, it's, yeah, uh, it's not the source, it's actually the, the drain here, but that has to move up along with it, right? So that you keep the same VGS. And to the extent that these two are the same device, if the VGS of this guy changed, VGS of that guy also should have changed. And roughly speaking, if everything is perfectly balanced, then these two voltages, the drain voltages, should end up at the same spot. Right? OK. So now let's just take a look at what happens over here. And now this is where we actually have a little bit more fun. So if I move the supply voltage around over here, How much should, well, first let's do, let's do the one thing first. So how much should the differential voltage change by if I move this supply? Zero. Yeah, it shouldn't change, right? Both sides should actually move up. OK, now, how about the column mode? How should the column mode change? GMRO. Uh, you said GMRO. I, I don't know, actually. It's the, now we're actually really, now it's getting really tricky. You could be right, actually. So. Uh, you'll, you'll go near the supply. Say that again. It'll get latched up, like, and go near the supply. Uh, I don't know, actually. So, so now, actually, this is really getting sort of interesting. So you said GMRO, and you could actually be right. So what were you assuming when you said that it was GR GMRO? Um, it's fast. It's fast. OK, well, there's actually one other really critical thing. OK? So when you said it's GMRO, what you were kind of saying was that you're going to amplify you know, if there was that one millivolt right here, you were kind of saying that somehow that's going to get amplified by changing the VGS of the transistor, right? Where were you assuming the gate for this thing came from? Fixed, fixed voltage. Ah, okay, so hang on. Remember, all voltages are relative. So you're right, it's fixed, but it's fixed relative to what? Ground. Ground, right? So you were assuming that this thing was biased like this. Right? Okay, and you're absolutely right. If you bias the thing that way, you would actually amplify the common, this power supply rejection, excuse me, this power supply change by GMRO into the common mode. Okay? Now, here's the interesting question for you guys. When you bias PMOS transistors, do you generally do this or do you generally do something else? I heard somebody say it. Just speak up. VDD. Yeah, generally you do something else, right? Usually what you actually do is something that looks more like that with, of course, a current source. So by the way, that thing, that looks a lot more like a voltage source referenced to VDD because I've got a 1 over GM connecting between VDD and the output. 
and something that ideally should be an open circuit on the other side, right? So now, if you tied the thing up this way, so if you had the bias with what I drew in blue over here and not with the voltage source, and by the way, if you did the voltage source, that's bad news. You don't want to do the voltage source to ground, excuse me. That's bad news. You don't want to do that. If you actually did bias it, quote, unquote, the right way, now, actually, what should happen to the common mode? This is a little bit more of a trick question, but still not too bad, I suppose. Find a line change by that much. Okay, that's that's one reasonable answer, right? So you're kind of saying, well, okay, if this, the VGS they're staying about fixed, then basically the common mode at the output essentially shouldn't change, and that's basically right. Now, the only thing that's a little bit not right about that is just that, of course, these transistors always have some RO associated with them, right? So I won't walk through it, but if you sort of looked at it, you could convince yourself that it would move, but it would move only because of the ROs of those devices, okay? So now, keep these things in mind, and in fact, you'll see some of this on if you look at some of the practice exams. With a lot of these things about power supply rejection and common mode rejection, a lot of the name of the game is figuring out how things are referenced to each other. Okay? And because of that, you know, again, just really subtle changes in the circuit can actually make a very big difference in terms of how it responds to things like common mode reject, common mode excitations, or power supply excitations, or both. <coughs> okay? And again, I think you'll see some examples of that in the exam, but keep these things in mind because you know the, this actually oftentimes is one of the most critical things that you deal with. Because you may have been really, really careful to design a very, very low noise circuit. But then just, you know, there was some digital gate off, you know, a few microns away from you that was banging on the supply and totally destroys all of your performance. Okay? So just keep these kinds of things in mind. And again, you'll see some more specific examples of that as we go through. Any questions on this, sir? Okay, so one last thing that I just wanted to briefly mention is when you really start working with fully differential circuits, um, just because at least for me, I don't like doing math in my head, you usually like to look at the waveforms that come out of the thing sort of as single-ended voltages, right? So rather than let's say, let's say we had our OTA or whatever it is, Rather than always looking at those two out ter output terminals and you know in my head doing the subtraction, you'd usually like to be able to just look at the differential voltage, right? Sort of relative to ground, let's say. So a lot of times, what you'll try and do is come up with some box that basically just takes those two voltages coming out of there and basically gives you one output terminal that's the differential output voltage again, relative to ground, and another one that's maybe the common mode voltage. Okay? Again, everything there on the right side being relative to ground. Okay? So, in fact, oftentimes what you'll try and do is you may even use this inside of your feedback loop. Right? So you may even do something like, well, okay, I'll do this this way first, or actually I'll do it over there. So you may even then say something like, okay, well, again, I'm lazy. I just want to draw one feedback network over there. So maybe what I'm going to do is something like, this, okay? Which isn't exactly right, but, so again, I may have another box over here that takes my input differential voltage and converts it to the actual voltages on those wires. And of course, I needed to do something, and I guess there's actually a capacitive feedback network there too, so I'll just put that in. Of course, you need to take the common mode as well, right? And so this would be VI common mode. And so you'd also want to put that thing in there like that as well. And again, this maybe is just to make your life a little bit easier in terms of looking at things. Right? In terms of specifying all the inputs. Okay. Well, so if you do something like this, by the way, the, I'll just label it, I guess. This is going to be 
vi plus, vi minus, and that's of course vo diff, vo common load. Those two boxes are basically the same thing, just flipped over, right? So one takes in the two wires and converts them to differential and common mode. The other one goes the other way, right? So it takes the differential and common mode and converts it into the two wires. OK, well, so usually when you first see something like this, the most natural response is to actually build that box out of E sources. So E sources are just voltage controlled voltage sources. So as an example, what people will often do is they'll say, OK, here's my VI plus, here's my VI minus. Why don't I just take that? And then as an example, generate the differential output by doing VI plus minus VI minus. OK, and then that's kind of like your box. There's obviously another one in there for the column mode. OK, so is that a good thing to put in that box, or is that going to cause a problem if we really used it the way I drew over here? What do you guys think? So let's say I literally took this box right here and plugged it in to do the conversion from wires to differential. What do you guys think? You have an ideal voltage source as your output? Yeah. Right? I kind of screwed things up, right? Because now I have an ideal voltage source driving my output. That's clearly bogus. So it turns out if you really want to do this, you have to use what's called Balens. Balens is just kind of a fancy way of, it's, it's really just a transformer. OK? And the good news is in SPICE, you can build ideal transformers that work at DC, which even though you can't really build that, SPICE you know, lets you do it. OK? So what I'm going to do is just quickly draw how would you build these so-called balins to effectively implement this box, just to make your life easier when you're doing these kinds of simulations. Okay? Because again, you want to make sure that you get all the loading conditions correct. But a lot of times, it's much easier to look at things in the either differential or common mode uh, manner. Okay? So let's just quickly draw what that would look like. Okay. So let's say that I have my input differential. So in other words, I'm, I'm starting by already specifying the differential, and I want to go into the two individual wires. Okay, So if I do that, then I'm going to get something that essentially looks like this. Okay, so I'm going to have two transformers here. For both of them, the turns ratio is going to be 2 to 1. Okay. Then what I do is, OK, so that top terminal over there, that's VO plus. This bottom one, that's VO minus. OK? Only thing left I have to do is now, that's my input common mode. OK? So just in case you guys sort of haven't seen these things before, I'm doing this 2 to 1 here because this input differential that's like my whole differential swing, right? So what I want to do is I want to have half of that differential show up as plus over the common mode on this side. And the other half show up as minus below the common mode on this side, right? So that's why I have these 2 to 1 ratios right there, right? And then just over here, I'm just using the fact that, you know, transformers, remember, it's just kind of like an inductor. And actually, in SPICE, ideal transformers are just basically shorts through here with a voltage source kind of in series with it. So if I put the input common mode on this center tap right there, I'm just basically biasing these two things to be relative to that input common mode. right? So basically, if you want to build this box, use this thing. Okay? And again, just do it in SPICE. Build, you know, you just use ideal transformers. It'll work beautifully, because now, those transformers will actually couple the real impedances you see in the circuit into what you're driving it through. Right? So you don't have to worry about messing up the loading conditions and things like that. Okay? So by the way, you know, do this once, keep that thing handy, you know, keep repeating it, because it'll be something you'll be using sort of all over the place whenever you have these differential circuits sitting around.
Okay, so unless there's any other questions, let's go ahead and actually move on to the next set of uh, lecture notes here. Okay, so these were handed out, I guess, I don't know, a couple lectures ago. So we sort of started talking about, you know, single-ended and differential amplifiers. And we've talked a little bit about just what those things look like. What I'm going to spend most of this lecture on is just really what's the sort of workhorse OTA that you're going to be using. Okay, and as we'll see in one second, even though, you know, we like the really nice, simple thing that I've drawn there, Oftentimes, that's, off, that's not quite going to cut it. Okay? It's, this particular design here has some sort of disadvantages, particularly from the standpoint of if we want to use it in a very general purpose context. Okay? So to see really what the disadvantage is, what I want to do is just walk through and figure out what is the actual output swing we can get from this amplifier. Okay? In other words, what's the maximum voltage we can get on the plus side? And what's the minimum voltage we can get on the downside? Okay? So let's just start doing that. And for all of these, you can just assume that we know sort of for each of the devices, let's call this, let's say that you know the so-called VD sat is something like V min P. Okay? And we'll say that for this device, there's some V min N. Okay? And let's also say that we know the V star. So let's say this guy has a V star P. And this guy over here has a V star N. OK? So now I'm going to look at everything just on one side, even though it's a fully differential amplifier. But of course, you can figure everything out based on doing both sides together. OK? So let's just do one side at a time. So first, if I look at this V out over here, What's the highest you can make that and not make anything go into triode? VDD minus V min P. Yeah, there we go. It's just VDD minus V min P. Right? Nothing magic there. OK. Now, how about on the lower side? And by the way, just to make our life easy. <coughs> Let's pretend we know what that node right there is. Let's just call that VXX, and let's pretend we know what it is. Now, what's the minimum voltage we can get over there, again, without making anything go into out of saturation? V min N plus VXX. Yeah, it's just VXX plus V min N, right? OK. <coughs> so now, what's actually going to set VXX? The common mode input. There we go. It's going to be set by, let's say that there's some input over here that we're just going to call VCM in. Right? So VXX is just going to be VCM in. There we go. Minus the VTH. Minus the V star of the NMOS device. Right? Or VOD if you prefer, but it's basically the V star. Okay? So now, if I look at the total swing, which of course is just VO max minus VO min, what you're going to get is something like the following. VDD minus VCM in, then plus you know, or minus a bunch of other terms. Okay? I'm not even going to bother with the other terms. So, why did I bother going through this whole thing? Well, the problem here is really that with this amplifier, the total swing you get is not independent of the common mode at the input. Right? In particular, if I have a very high common mode input, the swing you can get at the output is really small. Right? And in fact, even if I sort of do a halfway reasonable job of sort of setting all the common modes up, Oftentimes, this swing is maybe only about 200 millivolts or something like that, right? So that's kind of bad news for two reasons. One is if I want to use this as just a general purpose sort of OTA and I just want to throw it down kind of anywhere, well, if I have a really high common mode at the input, I might not be able to get any swing at all out of the thing, 
right? That's obviously bad news. The other piece of bad news is even if I sort of do a sort of reasonable job there, the swing I can really get may not be all that high, right? I may only get, let's say, a couple hundred millivolts. If I'm really worried about noise performance, meaning, or I should really say signal to noise ratio, I may actually really prefer to get much more swing in order to make the, the amount of noise I get small in comparison, right? Okay, so this sort of type of amplifier, even though here there's no cascoding or anything like that, this is kind of a so-called telescopic <coughs> amplifier, right? Meaning the input is directly coupled into the output, okay? And of course, if you add cascodes onto this thing, so let's say, you know, you added a cascode there and there, right? Obviously, life's even worse, right? If you can even fit the thing at all, right? Now, as we'll see in a second, if you really could build this telescopic thing, although the swing is small, the noise is going to be lower than the alternative. But that's life, okay? Our standard trade-off between swing and how much noise we can actually get. So in order to get around that problem, what you're really typically going to do is basically this folded cascode amplifier that I've drawn here. Okay, and again, this is really the sort of workhorse OTA that you probably will run into. So you know, if you're just building general OTAs and you're not sure exactly where it's used, this is probably what's going to show up. Now, here, I just switched it to a PMOS input stage, not, just, not because it needs to be PMOS, but just based on our previous discussion, I wanted to be able to tie the bodies. Okay, so that's how I decided to do that here. But obviously, you can do the same thing and flip it over with an NMOS. Okay? By the way, I'm sure, I'm assuming all of you guys have seen folded cascodes before. You know, raise your hand, I guess, if you haven't. Oh, I haven't seen folded cascode before. Okay, so just really quickly, that's okay. We won't pick on you. <laughs> so the way this thing works is it's actually a lot like a normal cascode. It's just that rather than having the current flow through, well, actually, let me draw a normal cascode, and then it'll be more clear. So in a normal cascode, all the bias current for the input device also flows through the cascode device, right? Well, imagine that instead all I basically do is something like the following. So essentially, I have some DC bias current flowing through my input device. But then essentially, I just use the cascode as a common gate amplifier off of whatever is created off that first stage, right? It's basically the same thing. It's just that I've folded the things around in terms of the voltage, right? So by doing this notice with voltage headroom, I'm not doing as bad as I used to be, right? Because here I had to have sort of all the way across that stack, right? So same basic idea. It's just that what's really nice about this is now I can actually decouple the input common mode from the swing that I get at the output, right? Because even if I move this common mode around, as long as I don't squash these devices right here, then basically the thing should still work. Because at least roughly speaking, my impedance sitting here is pretty low, right? The other nice thing about this is I can actually get a pretty reasonably wide output swing. Right? Okay, I've got you know the cascodes here, but basically I've just I can go up close to the, the VDD rail there just based on the dropout of this cascode, and down close to ground based on the dropout of that cascode. And again, that's largely independent of the input column mode range. Okay. The other thing that's kind of nice about these devices, about these amplifiers, is even though it looks a little bit complicated at first, it turns out the design of these things is very much just kind of fixed by the GM that you want. Because as we'll see in a second, even just sort of based on some really simple considerations, we can essentially figure out what should the bias currents through each one of these branches actually end up being. Okay. So in order to see that, let's just kind of go through it really quickly. So let's just say I have some ISS of current that I wanted at the input stage there. And I'm probably just going to pick that based on my standard gain bandwidth calculations and you know, V star. Okay. So if we've got some ISS of current flowing through here, then of course, in each one of these branches, 
I'm going to have ISS over 2 of current flowing, right? Okay, so now, next question is, if that's the case, how much current do I want flowing through that transistor right there? What do you guys think? ISS over 2 plus square root is flowing in the top. Okay, so what you said is actually absolutely correct, although it doesn't still, I guess, really answer, you know, so I actually want to pick a value. So what you said was, well, we're going to have to make this ISS over 2 <coughs> plus whatever, and I'll just call this, let's say, IB2 plus whatever IB2 is. I totally agree with that. That's absolutely correct. But I'm actually going to claim that even, with, even without looking at this thing up over on the top right there, we can actually figure out what this current's going to have to be just by looking at this circuit, okay, or that piece of the circuit right there. So what do you guys think? What's this sum going to have to be? ISS? Ah, I agree. So you said it's going to have to be ISS. I agree with that. Why? Uh, because if you uh, shift the current to one leg, it should still be able to sync it. There we go. Exactly. Okay. So just to make things clear, I'm going to write this all out, and then you'll see why it is that it really has to be ISS. So this is really going to have to be ISS, which, based on actually exactly what Eric said before, means that this is going to have to be ISS over 2. Okay? And the reason for that is quite simple, and I'll do this in blue. Let's say that I have a really big input voltage, okay? Big differential <coughs> input voltage. And let's say it's big enough that I actually get ISS of current flowing over here and no current flowing on the other side, right? Well, if I've got ISS of current flowing through that side, I want to make sure that this bottom device over here can actually sync that ISS of current, right? Because if it can't, what's basically going to happen is <coughs> I'm essentially going to clip my output voltage too early. Right? I won't like, get the full possible gain from my input stage. Because right? obviously if this is less than ISS, then essentially just the output voltage is going to get clipped by whatever that maximum current is. Which kind of means I'm wasting current in my front end over here. Right? <laughs> So just because of, I want to be able to make use of all of the current coming in, that already tells you this has to be ISS. Well, OK, so if this has to be ISS and this is nominally ISS over 2, well, makes perfect sense. Each one of these branches is also going to be ISS over 2, just to make the DC biasing work, right? OK, well, guess what? Now, you know, basically, from a design standpoint, that's kind of it. Right, obviously, I have to pick some V stars and things like that. But once I know this ISS over here, all of the other bias currents are basically fixed. Again, assuming that I don't want to be wasteful, which usually is a good assumption. OK? OK, so now we've got this folded CAS code. We know sort of roughly what the swing is going to be. As I had said before, there's always, of course, going to be the penalty that we pay to get that extra swing, we're going to have to pay some basically extra noise. Okay, and so to see that, what I want to do is compare the NF or the noise factor of this amplifier to the noise factor of, let's just say, our simple you know, telescopic amplifier that, let's say, looks something like that. Okay, so let's say that's V in, let's say that's V out, that's some V bias. Okay? Obviously, there's some tail current source and stuff like that there that I'm ignoring. Okay, and so, and again, in this case, for the NF, what I'm interested in is how much noise is going to show up at the output relative to the noise from the input device. Okay, so I just want to normalize it by that amount. Okay, and for all of these, I'm going to assume that we're just looking at sort of things that are at low enough frequency where the filtering from the cascodes doesn't matter. Okay. So as we had talked about, I believe, last time, what is the sort of noise factor or NF for the telescopic design, the simple one that I drew right there? And let's just call this M2, call that M1. Okay. 
What is that? Anybody remember? One plus the V star ratios. Yeah, it's one plus, and which V star goes on top, and which V star goes on the bottom. And or V star one over V star. Yeah, it's V one star <coughs> over V two star. Right, because remember again, big V star means small GM. Right, so the smaller the GM of the PMOS device, the less noise it's adding. Okay, so if you're ever confused, just you know, write it down both ways, and then ask yourself what happens as you change it. Right. Okay, so that's indeed the noise fact factor you get from the, te the telescopic design. Okay, so now, what's the noise factor we're going to get from this folded cascode design? And just to help you guys out, I'll remind you there's ISS over 2 of nominal bias there. <coughs> there's ISS of nominal bias over here. And there's ISS over 2 nominal bias right there. And again, for this, let's just assume that we know the V stars of the different devices. Okay, so let's say I know the V star of M1, I know the V star of M3, and of M5. And to make life easy, let's just assume the cast codes don't really add in that much noise, which, as we talked about before, generally speaking, is indeed the case. So what's the NF for this thing going to be? And maybe we can do it sort of piece by piece. So first of all, you know, the first term in this thing should be really, really obvious. So what's the very first term? Yeah, 1, right? There's definitely going to be a 1 plus. OK. So now, how about from M3? How much noise is M3 going to add relative to M1? Ah, OK. You said there's a factor of 2. I agree. There's a factor of 2 in there. Times what? By the way, where is that factor of 2 coming from? Yeah, it just had double the current. Yeah, you've got double the current flowing through it, right? <laughs> so for the same V star, it has twice the GM. I agree with that. So what's the only other thing left we have to scale here? V star ratio. Yeah, the V star ratio, right? So it's going to be 2 times V1 star over V3 star, right? OK. Now, how about from M5 over here? How much noise is that going to add? One star by V3 star. Yeah, exactly. So that one it has the same bias current as M1. So the only thing that's different is the V star, right? So indeed, that's the NF you're going to get for the folded cast code. And notice, especially because of this factor of 2 right here, that's definitely going to be larger than what you could get from the telescopic design. Okay? So a typical number for this NF is probably like, I don't know, 2, 2.5, something like that. Even if you sort of try and muck around with the V stars here to reduce that impact. Okay? So you definitely have to pay a noise penalty when you build this thing. But you do get the swing, and you get the ability to tolerate a bunch of input column mode ranges. Okay? So again, this is sort of our standard noise versus swing trade-off. Does this make sense to everybody? Okay, good. So, just like we had done with sort of the simpler amplifier, what I want to do now is just, you know, pretend that we put this thing together in SPICE, and then just go through sort of a set of the simulations we would do to kind of understand whether or not this thing is really working the way we want it to work. Okay? Or really just what are the checks we should do to ensure that that's the case. So here I'm just showing the schematic. It's really basically just the same schematic as we looked at before. I just happened to put a cast code on the tail current source over there. Okay? But basically this is really just exactly the same thing as I had shown before. So just like last time, first thing you're going to want to do is a DC simulation. Okay, and like before, we're going to do that DC simulation for a couple of reasons. So one is, we just want to check that the biasing is correct. Right? We want to check that the V stars are actually behaving the way we expect them to. Right? So that all the devices are actually sitting where they should be. The other thing that's actually sort of a little bit important, which maybe you'd even want to do with the other amplifier as well, is you really want to check that 
as you move the input, or actually this is the output differential voltage around, you want to make sure that the bias current you get flowing into that output, and by the way, just to be clear, I've actually split out the top side from the bottom side, just so that I can tell how much current is coming out from here versus how much current is coming out from there. Okay, so on these plots, I'm actually looking at both of those at the same time. So the other thing you want to check is that as you move that differential output voltage, which of course is happening because you move the input differential voltage, you want to make sure that you're still getting as much current as you expected to. Okay? And in fact, you want to push this sort of, you know, all the way to being like fully steered to one side or the other to make sure that even when you put that big differential voltage in, you get all of the ISS flowing out. Okay? Because as an example, if you weren't quite careful with your biasing or something like that, it's entirely possible that one of the devices in here goes into triode, and you don't actually get the full ISS that you expected. Okay? And as we'll talk about you know, actually fairly soon, you really want that full ISS, for example, from the standpoint of slewing the output. Right? So again, just another check you should really do in your design to make sure things are sort of lining up with what you expect them to be. Okay? All right, so let's assume we've done that. That's pretty straightforward. Then, again, next thing you'd probably do is look at the gain, both the small signal gain and the large signal gain, which is all I've plotted right here. Okay, so there's just kind of a couple of interesting things I wanted to, to note here, uh, which hopefully many of you have seen before. So the first is, let's say that I specify, I don't know, I want a gain of greater than 50, let's say. Uh, by the way, this was done with, I believe, a 3.3 volt power supply. So let's say I wanted a gain, of, a gain of greater than 50. If you take a look at this thing, what you'll see is that I can maintain a gain of 50 all the way from about minus, I don't know, almost 2 volts up to plus 2 volts differential swing. So I'm actually getting 4 volts differential swing. Remember, I just said I only had a power supply of 3.3 volts. So am I breaking some physics here, or does this actually make sense? What do you guys think? How did I get a swing, you know, peak to peak of 4 volts with only a supply of 3.3? Differential. Okay, yeah, it's a differential, but, you know, w how does that help us? <laughs> what does that mean? <coughs> Okay, let's maybe think about it this way. So I'm just going to draw one side of my output stack over here, right? Okay, so, and I'll just draw, let's say, some current source over here as being my input. Okay, so if I want to, if let's say that that input current gets really high, right, so that I basically, all of my current flows through there so that there's no current at all through that bottom device. What's this output voltage over here going to swing up close to? Yeah, it's going to be close to VDD, right? If I looked at the other side, meaning the other part of the differential, that would be down close to ground, right? Okay, so if I kind of like draw, you know, if this is like the pair of voltages, and let's say that's the plus side and this is the minus side, I'm going to get VDD and zero, right? If I flip it around, of course, meaning the input is now all the way on the other side, now I have 0 and VDD, right? Well, notice, if I really could go all the way to 0 and all the way up to VDD, <coughs> what this is kind of saying is that in one case, the differential is plus VDD, and in the other case, it's minus VDD. So of course, if I look at the peak-to-peak -peak swing, I have two VDD, right? So just because, you know, so there's no actual physics being broken here. It's just that since I'm taking the difference between two sides, since each side can swing close to the power supply, the total swing you can get is actually, well, in the limit, twice of the power supply. Okay? 
<laughs> so even though I said I have you know this 3.3 volt supply, it's actually pretty reasonable that I actually got a little bit more than the power supply in terms of swing. And I got like 4 volts instead of about 3.3. Okay? So no magic there. It's just the, the properties of looking at the differential output. So the other thing I wanted to just sort of briefly mention here is that if you look at this plot, it looks very, very symmetric. Meaning, if you go to a negative output differential versus a positive output differential, it's exactly the same. Kind of makes sense because the whole circuit is symmetric, right? So you shouldn't expect that you'd see anything different. However, oftentimes that's actually kind of not as useful from the standpoint of debugging. Because let's say that you didn't actually get sufficient gain, or you didn't actually get sufficient swing. Okay? Just by looking at this plot, I really don't know kind of which transistor or set of transistors is causing me the biggest problem. So in fact, what you typically will want to do is rather than just looking at the gain of the whole structure altogether, what you often want to do is look at what's the RO of the NMOS device at the same time and independently as to what's the RO of the PMOS device. Okay? And in fact, by the way, that's exactly why if you look at the schematic, there's this little split here. So both I can actually look at the individual currents, and I can actually get plots like this where I look at the individual ROs of the two devices. Okay? So if I do this, then now it's actually much more clear to me if I wanted to get more swing, which device I really need to go after in terms of increasing its output impedance. Right? Because before, if I didn't actually look at this, the only thing I could do is kind of just, I don't know, try and increase the channel length of everything or play with the V stars or something like that. Now, at least I really know which side it is that's really limiting my swing. And obviously, if you've done a good job, you kind of want to roughly balance those two out. Not that they should really be exactly the same, but you know, if one of them is really, really, you know, let's say the other, one of them had a curve that looked like this, good indication that you really want to go and fix that one. Right? Maybe your V star is too large or something like that. Okay? So whenever you do these characterizations, make sure you pay attention to not just the total gain, but the RO of the individual devices in your amplifier as well. Because okay? again, that's really the only way you can figure out how you would go about fixing some sort of gain problem. Okay, but other than that, the rest of the characterization procedure is actually very, very similar to what our sort of standard amplifier would have been. Okay, so what I want to do next is actually talk about a couple of other, let's say, interesting phenomenon that will A, be reminders of things that you probably should have learned or, or known at some point but may have forgotten. And actually, it will also be sort of a good introduction to feedback, which I guess has uh, you know, caused some fear in various circles here. So we'll, we'll, we'll take a look at that in one second. So first, let me just do one sort of quick thing, again, as kind of a reminder. So what I've drawn here is still the same folded cascode OTA. But this time around, I actually added an extra cascode onto the input pair here. Now, usually when I do this, people look at me really funny and say, what in the heck? Why would you want to do something like that? Well, in order to understand why you'd want to do that, let's actually sort of remind ourselves even in the telescopic amplifier, what another reason you sometimes want to add a cascode in is. Okay? And in particular, I'm interested now in frequency response. Okay? So let me just draw sort of a telescopic cascode amplifier. So let's say it's something like this. So that's a V bias, that's V in, and that's V out. So anybody remember, why do you sometimes, and by the way, this is, let's say, really a load resistor that maybe is pretty small, actually. Why do you sometimes want to add cascodes even into things where the gain isn't all that high? Miller effect. Don't yeah, you're trying to reduce the Miller effect, <coughs> right? Because if I do this, then now that CGD, right, I'm looking into... And now we'll have to actually be a little bit careful. I'm looking into something that is supposed to be a low impedance. 
And so if it's a low impedance, then I'm just reducing the Miller multiplication of that CGD, right? Okay, so now here comes the really interesting question. And this is where people usually sort of either forget or get confused about things. So then actually let's go back to our old you know, picture for the <coughs> amplifier. Yeah. So let's say that I was indeed worried about that Miller effect. Right? So I'm really worried about the parasitic capacitance that I'm going to get from here to there. And I want to make sure that that's small. Well, oftentimes, yeah, we should close the door. So oftentimes, when people first look at this, they say something like, well, hey, what the heck? Why, why are you even worried about you know, the Miller effect? Because Okay, I've got some CGD right there, but hey, I have a cascode sitting right here. If I've got this cascode, aren't I going to make sure that basically the, the impedance I see looking into here, isn't that already going to be 1 over GM? Isn't that already going to be small? Well, so is it really going to be small or not? What do you guys think? No, it, it will be very big. Ah, this okay. Why is it big? It depends on the... Uh, impedance of the drain side. Bingo, right? So the key thing is, even though we like to always say that if you look into the source, it's 1 over GM, it actually depends on what's the load on the other side as well. Okay, because the key thing to remember is anytime you have a transistor, if you looked at the swing on the drain versus the swing on the source, that ratio is always GMRO. Okay? So in other words, if this is, let's say, V-swing, this is always V-swing divided by GMRO. Okay? Well, so if I only get one GMRO of isolation, notice with this folded cascode and design, the gain I get to that point is something like GMRO squared, right? That means that the gain I have at these internal nodes right here, since I'm only isolated by GMRO, is actually about GMRO, right? Because if I had GMRO squared at the output and I divide that by GMRO, I just get GMRO. So now, even though I have the cascode, I could actually be Miller multiplying that CGD by the gain of the input device, okay? So because of that, again, if you really want to make sure you have a sort of nice, fast amplifier with low CGD, or low effective CGD, you might indeed add yet another cascode over here, right? Because if I do that, then now, okay, this output would have been GMRO squared. This guy over here is still going to be GMRO. But now on the drain of the input device, that's just going to be one, right? So by doing that again, I'm substantially reducing the effective CGD. Okay? Does this make sense to everybody here? So by the way, if you know, in case you've forgotten this, just go back and you know remind yourself what's the actual input impedance of a cascode device as a function of the load resistance. Okay? And if you get a large load resistance, the input and piece of the cascode will also be large. Okay? Okay. So now just one last sort of fun thing, and this is really kind of almost as an intro into our next lecture, which is going to be about feedback. Turns out you can actually do some very, again, innocuous things that may cause issues that you hadn't thought about before. Okay? So for this particular example, much like I actually did in that simulation schematic, I'm again just showing my folded cascode OTA, but I decided I was going to use a cascoded current source over here. And since, hey, I'm using a cascoded current source with a PMOS over there, and I have the same thing as the load, why don't I just connect the bias lines together? Okay? Seems very reasonable thing to do, right? Well, as we're going to see in one second, if you do that, you're actually going to get a feedback loop. Anybody know which, you know, anybody know which mode that feedback loop is going to be occurring in, by the way? Is it going to be a differential feedback loop? Yes. 
or a common mode feedback loop. Any thoughts? Or guesses, I should say. I heard somebody say it. Just speak up. Yeah, it's probably going to be a common mode loop, right? Because this thing over here, any sort of changes you make on these biases, kind of should only affect the column mode right there, right? OK, so let's see how you could actually get that feedback loop. OK, so remember, there's always some CGD, right? So of course, there's also going to be a CGD there and a CGD right there. In fact, there's also going to be CGD here, CGD there, and CGD there, right? OK, so now let's just pretend some, I don't know, cosmic particle or something, some magic thing came in and caused the little glitch in voltage to go up right at VBP1 right there. So if that happens, what's going to happen to the voltage on the common source node of these input devices, meaning the tail node right there? Which direction is that going to go, up or down? What's the sign of the gain of a common source amplifier? Down. Yeah, it's going to go down, right? This thing here just looks like a common source amplifier. So if the input goes up, the output goes down. OK? If the output goes down, what's going to happen on that point and that point? Are they going to go up or go down? Again, not a trick question. Yeah, OK, well, it's pointing in the right point. It's going to go down, right? So both of those are going to go down. In other words, the common mode is going to go down. Well, if the common mode goes down there, guess what? It's also going to go down right there, right? Because again, I'm just going through a common gate amplifier. OK, well now, and let me just draw this slightly like that. Well, if those go down, then of course, this is also going to go down. And so finally, we come back to where we started, and it's actually going to go back down. So I have a complete loop, right? I started right there. I ended also on that same bias line. So what kind of feedback loop is this? Yeah, it's a negative feedback loop. OK, that's kind of good news, because if it was a positive feedback loop, then we'd be much more scared, right? But guess what? We'll see in one second how we can make that happen, too. So it's at least a negative feedback loop. So I can kind of say, OK, phew, it's, you know, I got a feedback loop, but maybe it's not so bad, because at least it's a negative feedback loop. And in fact, I could even argue, oh, maybe this is even a good thing, because this is a negative common mode feedback loop. So maybe it's actually going to help stabilize my common mode. Well, what's the potential really bad news if you're not too careful about this? What should you check? Stability. Yeah. Anytime you get a feedback loop, you better check the darn thing's stable. Because if it's not stable, let's just say that, you know, in this particular case it was it was unstable. Because as an example, you know, you have some parasitic cap over there, you have some parasitic cap over here, you've got multiple poles in that loop. So it could indeed be unstable. Well, Turns out, if it was indeed unstable, what you'd basically have is, and by the way, you'd only see this if you simulated the common mode or actually checked to the common mode, right? If it was actually unstable in the common mode, then what would happen is the common mode there would basically oscillate, right? It would oscillate between, roughly speaking, VDD and ground. Well, that's bad news, because trust me, if your common mode is oscillating between VDD and ground, even if you simulated in SPICE that you had great differential gain, amplifier ain't going to work, right? So the point there is really, you know, be very careful. And I think I mentioned this before. Anytime you have these fully differential circuits, make sure to check the column mode too. In fact, make sure to check that you don't actually have some weird feedback loops that you didn't expect you might have. Or if you do, check that they're actually stable, OK? So as I mentioned, in this particular case, just so happened that we got negative feedback. But 
turns out it's actually quite easy for us to end up with positive feedback. And the way that can happen is, let's say you take this, the output of this amplifier, and you tie it actually to another amplifier stage. Okay, So I'm just going to do something again, very, very innocent. I'm going to take that output, tie it to, let's say, some common source input. And then I'm also going to just share that same bias line. Okay. Well, if you walk through this loop, what you'll find is that now, because of this extra inversion right here, the feedback coming from that path is actually going to be positive feedback, not negative feedback. So now we have some real fun. And by the way, I'm going to briefly walk through this one because you know this is one we like to ask in the prelims, which I know many of you guys are thinking about. So let's see what's going to happen if we get something like this. So now I've got, and I'm going to sort of draw a little bit more abstract model now. So now I've kind of got something that has, you know, it's some amplifier with some common mode gain, right? I've got one feedback loop that's negative feedback, okay? But I've actually got another feedback loop that's actually positive feedback. Okay, so F1, that's like my negative feedback gain. F2, that's like my positive feedback gain. Okay, so now what I want to know is, and again, since this is a really common prelim question, what, what do I really need to make sure is going to be the case in order to guarantee that this thing is going to be stable, at least at DC? Somebody other than Shiva. F1 greater than F2? Yeah. Better be the case that F1 is greater than F2. Right? Because if it's not, that means on the net, you actually have positive feedback. Right? Because the net feedback gain, of course, is just F2 minus F1. And you want that whole quantity to be negative to make sure that the overall loop is actually stable. Okay? So... Keep this one in mind, because actually it pops up in all kinds of circuits that you've probably seen before. So as an example, how many of you guys have built band gap references before? OK, well, guess what? Exactly this analysis is what you have to do to prove to yourself that the band gap doesn't actually oscillate. OK? Or at least the way that people build band gaps doesn't actually oscillate. OK? By the way, just, as, you know, just to make sure maybe it's clear to everybody, anybody have a thought as to whether or not F1 is going to be greater than F2 in this particular circuit that I've drawn here? What do you guys think? Take a guess. It's more cap, right? Say that again? It's more cap for F1. It's more cap for F1. Uh, OK, that may be true. now. I guess it depends on how exactly I size this thing. So let's say that actually I did, you know, this. And, you know, that they were roughly the same size. So now what do you guys think? What's the gain from this point to that point? Negative. Say that again? Negative. Okay, it is indeed negative. What's like the magnitude of that game? It's GMRO, right? So when I go from this point to this point, I have a GMRO, but negative of gain, right? So if this cap right there, meaning the CGD from these devices, is about the same as this CGD, notice I have effectively the same capacitive coupling, but an extra GMRO of gain, right? That's probably bad news. So that probably means F2 is actually bigger than F1, right? Hmm. So by the way, how do I fix this? How do I avoid this kind of problem? Add a gate resistor. Oh, OK. Wow, OK. You guys are clever. OK, so that's one thing you could do. You could try and have a gate resistor there. That might indeed work. Um, 
That doesn't necessarily solve the DC problem, although it's all capacitive coupling, so maybe the problem isn't the DC. You could indeed do that. Anything else you might do? By the way, the gate resistor has some other implications you have to be a little bit careful about. So, anything else? Why not just filter the bias? Oh, how would I filter the bias? By the way, putting a gate resistor is kind of like filtering. So how would you filter it? Put a cap. Okay, so you might try and put a cap over here, right? In fact, maybe I even get rid of the gate resistor. And just try and put a big cap on those biases right there. Now, by the way, is adding that cap going to change the ratio between F1 and F2? What do you guys think? With no gate resistor, by the way. At DC it won't. It's not going to change it, right? It's still going to be a ratio of GMRO times larger. However, it turns out adding that cap may indeed help. So what would adding that cap actually help with? So let's say I did indeed end up with positive feedback. What would adding that cap maybe have happened? Loop gain would have been less than there you go, right? Maybe I can at least make it so that the loop gain is less than one. Right? So this may not help the sign of the feedback, but it'll at least reduce the loop gain to be less than one so that on the net the whole thing is stable. Now, by the way, I claim there's actually something else that's maybe even simpler <coughs> that we could do. So what's the even simpler thing we could do? Bias them separately. There we go, right? Just bias them separately, right? Just don't connect those darn things together. Right? Have a separate current mirror that generates the bias for this guy independently of the bias for this guy. Now, by the way, even that's not perfect because obviously there's always some residual coupling you know, back through the mirrors and etc. But if you're really paranoid, and by the way, oftentimes you should be paranoid, especially if you have really, really high gain circuits, best bet is indeed to actually just use a separate bias for each one of the legs. Especially if you're talking about something where you have multiple amplifiers in a cascade. So you can imagine, you know, if I started adding more and more of these amplifiers, you know, your life could get really interesting in terms of analyzing that feedback loop there. Right? You'll have all kinds of nested negative and positive feedback loops. So any other questions on this? Or? Okay, good. So this is actually a very nice intro into our next topic which is now really going to be feedback. Okay? So, although I guess many of you guys were sort of uh, scared or intimidated or whatever, um, turns out I'm actually not going to spend a ton of time on feedback. Because I'm going to assume that actually you've seen a lot of this stuff before. So I'm going to assume you know why it is you actually want to use feedback, as well as what sort of some of the issues with using feedback are. Okay, And if you're not sure, you know, you haven't seen this in a while, then definitely go back and review Gray and Meyer, you know, chapters 8 and 9. Review Razavi, that's chapter 8. Uh, Tom Lee's book has some nice discussion of feedback. But definitely go back and sort of take a look. Okay. So what I'm really going to focus here on is actually just sort of two issues. So one is, which again I'm assuming you've seen many times before, is stability. But I'm actually going to talk about some things that maybe you didn't see before, or maybe issues that weren't sort of the first things that you were taught to worry about. Okay? In fact, I'm actually going to talk about sort of some practical issues you run into when you really want to do some, not just analysis, but check the stability of your circuit. Okay? The other thing, which will really be more on the next lecture, is to talk about how the settling behavior of these feedback loops in the time domain looks like. Okay? Because again, I'm going to assume that many of you guys have seen things like, okay, we have some amplifier, it has some transfer function, and I have some, let's say, sinusoidal signal that I know is sitting there. Really easy to figure out what the amplifier is going to do to that sinusoidal signal. Right? But if you remember, we said a lot of times we're going to be dealing with these switched capacitor circuits. Well, in switched capacitor circuits, most of the time you're going to be amplifying pulses or impulses and not sinusoids. Okay? So in that context, it's actually much more useful to think about things in the time domain 
in particular to think about how long does it take you to settle accurately to be close to where you wanted the final output to be. Okay, and just in case you know you've sort of forgotten about that or why it is that I'm saying that I'm really going to have pulses, this is just a reminder as to sort of what our switch cap amplifier might look like. Right? And so remember initially in one of the phases I'm just going to essentially reset that cap to ground, right? And sample the input over here. Then in the next phase when I turn on that switch, that's when I'm actually amplifying the thing. So just to be clear, what does the voltage on that node look like right when I turn on that switch? What happens right when I turn on that switch? Minus V. Uh, okay, it actually it actually turns out it's going to jump up, just because you know I have uh. a positive charge right there, and I started it at ground, right? But so basically, it's going to jump up, right? Okay, so now as the amplifier starts responding to that, now what's going to happen? Charge. Yeah, it's going to have this sort of exponential discharge, right? It's going to look something like this. Well, guess what? That's clearly not a sinusoid, right? And at the end, what you're really going to care about is basically how close to the final value that you expected does your amplifier really get within a given amount of time, right? Because remember, you're going to be clocking this thing at a certain rate. So we'll actually spend a lot of our time on, again, not today, but you know, probably the following lecture, is how do we take these amplifiers that we're going to be using in feedback and really get a better understanding of their settling behavior. Okay? So before we do that, I did want to just you know, spend a little bit of time just reviewing sort of stability and some of the issues that we're going to run into from the standpoint of analyzing stability in our circuits. Okay? So here I'm sort of taking the, almost the mathematician's view and just drawing some generic feedback circuit. Okay? And the reason I'm going to do this is for a couple, couple things. One is just to sort of remind you guys what the real benefit of feedback is. And the other is to see how, unfortunately, even though we really like to think of things in this very simple canonical model, oftentimes in our real circuits, they don't exactly fit into this sort of framework here. Okay? So what I'm drawing here, of course, is just you know, my standard feedback amplifier. So I have some forward open loop gain AV, some feedback factor F, so I'm going to define the loop gain or the loop transfer as this capital T is just AV times F, right? So that's just the loop gain from this V error signal back to there, okay? So as again, you guys should hopefully be very, very familiar with, if I look at the closed loop gain of this whole circuit, it's just going to be AV, the forward gain, divided by 1 plus T where again T is just AV times F, okay? So if we just rewrite that slightly, you can basically say that this thing is really just 1 over F times 1 over 1 plus 1 over T, okay? So why did I bother sort of going through that whole manipulation there? Because what I really want to show here is the whole point of doing that feedback in the first place is that if you build a large open loop gain T, then your closed loop gain should very, very closely approximate that 1 over F. Okay? So again, in fact, the whole reason you use feedback in almost all, well, not, maybe not all, but in very, very, you know, 90x percent of the situations is just because you want to find a way to very precisely set your gain, okay? your closed loop gain. And of course, this is all just relying on that it's usually easier to figure out something that's you know, a precise small number, meaning a precise, let's say, division ratio, than it is to get a really, really precise gain. Okay? So that's the reason you're typically going to be using feedback. So I think we'll pick up with this on next time, but just as sort of a preview even though that's sort of the nice, simple way to look at feedback circuits. Of course, you go and you try and build some real feedback circuit, and 
oftentimes it doesn't exactly map in to that model. So maybe it's kind of a quote unquote homework. You know, next time when we come in, I'll ask you guys sort of what's wrong with the mapping that I've done here? What's sort of missing and why will this mapping not really work exactly correct? But we'll pick back up with that next time. So see you guys on Tuesday.